So who am I? Why am I here talking to you? Uh, as Keith just outlined, uh, you know, team lead at Devon, uh, been in Cal Calgary looking after that uh, since 2010. Uh, SAG-D operations is my focus right now, which are steam-assisted gravity drainage up in the oil sands bitumen area. So wells and flow lines on surface, no mining involved with SAG-D. And yes, the uh, background of land management planning and forest officer in north central Alberta. Uh, many of the same areas we've seen on our slides today. Uh, with that came all the uh, angst of figuring out where our water courses are. And about 2005, 2006, I was at a CLRA conference in uh, Red Deer. Barry was there giving a presentation, kicking off uh, wet areas mapping and, and expounding on all the great things. The lights came on, absolutely I needed this tool. So I worked with Barry, um, we can go through this. I worked with Barry to actually acquire uh, the wet area mapping algorithm uh, process on some LIDAR we owned in our SAGD area. Uh, with UNB and some research work, and that has proven very beneficial to, to my operations. So just as a, an overview, these are the provincial water course and water body descriptions. Uh, should be very familiar to many of you. Large permanent, small permanent, intermittent, ephemeral are the key ones that uh, we, we need to be aware of when it comes to setback requirements. And depending on what you're pro planning to develop on the land, uh, any one of those could have a, a key impact to your, to your cost or your program and your schedule. And then in the bottom part, the water bodies, uh, lakes, shallow open uh, ponds, peatlands, wetlands, you name it, they're all listed. Um, so as you can see, uh, you know, symbolizing the, the blue water, roads being a barrier, determining where your culverts go, uh, very key with the index. But I'll uh, keep sliding right into some of the specifics that we have. So. With, uh, with our SEG-D operations, we do what are called strat wells, stratigraphy. So we're determining where the bitumen layer is, what the thickness is, and what some of the quality may be. And that requires us to make small, approximately half hectare well sites. Uh, that takes about three days to set up a rig, drill, and, and leave. So these are very temporary, frozen ground uh, condition only type sites. And the wet area mapping uh, has proven extremely valuable in locating these and reducing the cost of building them. So just two examples here. Uh, these are two, two sites that are relatively close to each other in uh, some fens in, in, our, in a part of our land base. We've got about 200 square miles here. That's my focus. Uh, very, very easy to get familiar with, but again, with uh, wet areas, it's that much better. Um, if you, I think the next one. Yeah, this one that shows, so, the bottom picture, classic, uh, classic fen, lots of tamarack, um, stands out very well in the wet area mapping. Uh, this is the stream uh, predicted layer in the background, not the, not the bog layer. And as we go through, we'll see some of the uh, bog layer examples. But with these strat wells, I'm looking for very flat locations. So we're disturbing as little soil or potentially soil ridges as we can. And before, uh, it, it was just a shot in the dark. I mean, we need X amount of locations per quarter section, depending on what we're trying to prove up. And it, it gets to be pretty intensive on the landscape. This is uh, um, an exaggerated 3D example that is developed in Global Mapper. Um, this has been instrumental. And this is five times exaggeration, I think. Actually, the fellow who did that sitting in the audience, he can yell at me if I'm wrong. It's either three or five times is what we find is a good, good representative, representative in Global Mapper for the very quick planning. So you can see the shape of our well sites and trying to predict how, where we should move them and when we go to lay these out on the ground, then we verify what the water course is at that time, whether it's ephemeral or intermittent and then what our setback is based on that. And more often than not, these are wetlands and fens with these wells, uh, there, there's no sumps on site, there's very little chance of contamination. Uh, being adjacent to or right beside an ephemeral is not, uh, not an issue. Uh, a great promotion here for Global Mapper, if those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's an excellent tool for uh, quickly planning in uh, using your LiDAR data and layering in the, the wet area mapping uh, layer. Very effective. 
this is an example of some route planning. Uh, this is a, a road corridor where we're going to parallel with a pipeline. And after assessing the road corridor, it was an existing road built in 1980, um, pretty much built on the high, high ground. It slopes either way. But up in the top here corner, you can see where we added a culvert based on the wet area mapping data. This is a very high use road, 10 meter, 11 meter surface uh, in the middle of our, our active area that's going to become more busy. And we, uh, we need to make sure the integrity of this road is the best it can be uh, for maintenance costs. Your maintenance costs, knowing what your water is doing, is probably 50% of your, of your cost when you look at the long term main haul road scenario. And again, up in the top left hand is uh, full feature LIDAR uh, snap out of uh, Global Mapper. So like all the other slides that show the existing uh, hydrology, uh, this is our, our jackfish and pike mineral lands. So when we're talking oil and gas, different than an FMA. But uh, the red area are, are lands that we had 100% and the yellow is areas that we're evaluating to determine what, uh, what's out there for, for potential resource. And the existing hydrology was uh, very obvious. Lots, a couple of small uh, rivers, lots of lakes, lots of wetlands, lots of streams. Now when you compare that to the predicted uh, flow layer using wet area mapping, uh, very significant impact on the landscape for your planning purposes. And when you go to the bog layer, uh, even more. So those primarily are those solid blue areas that got filled in that showed, uh, you know, in, in the lines from the predicted flow, uh, those generally would be fins, and some of them rich fins. With our uh, well pad planning, so this is uh, an existing planning area. We have some existing wells in here, and these are seven to ten well pairs because with SAG D, we need to have a uh, production line that goes horizontal underground as well as a steam line. So the production line is at the bottom of the uh, thickness of the, of the bitumen layer, and the steam is uh, usually three to five meters above that. It heats up the bitumen so that it can flow, and it gets pushed to surface with the steam pressure and uh, lift gas that's injected. So these are pretty intensive well sites. They're typically um, three hectares in size, depending on how they land on, on the terrain, and the pipelines that connect them are actually above ground pipelines because with steam and hot products, uh, we have to have much better control over expansion and contraction. So this is the uh, existing uh, hydrology layer in our Jackfish 1 area. The, um, you see we're section 28 there, J1 CPF. That's the processing facility where the steam is generated, the uh, products come back to, and then off to the north are the um, uh, polygons where the individual well pads are for that facility at this time. So throwing in here the predicted flow, uh, you can see very, very quickly how that impacts the landscape with our, with our development. And we knew we had lots of traditional muskeg, uh, and people like to use that term very loosely in this province, uh, defining that with where the water is actually moving and how that is uh, with our fen as compared to a bog has been very important for us to determine, uh, especially with our road placement and, and well site placement. Uh, this is a pipeline project we had planned in the same area. Uh, with the wet area mapping in place, and I've got another detail of this, anything where there's predicted flow, we identify with a uh, coordinate and send our biologists to the field to classify it, period. Um, I know water may move there someday if it's not there today, the day they're there or the day after they're there or before they're there, that, that does not matter to me. I need to know what that looks like on the ground. It's fully assessed so we can document it for our application processes and come up with an operations plan on how it will cross with the uh, road pipe, you know, whether it's temporary or permanent. Uh, this particular project, uh, we were paralleling a pipeline that was done six years ago. The intelligence from six years ago was only about a third of the crossings as to what we identified and classified with wet areas mapping. This is a good example. Um, the corridor here, the photo is a little fuzzy. 
Uh, of course, everybody's got an iPhone, but sometimes not everybody can use it good. So you can see that the, uh, the, there's water, there's vegetation. If you went across this thing in, I don't know, August, you may not notice it. If you went across it in January, you would not notice it. That is one of the biggest problems with our operations. Uh, very time sensitive, and anything that we're planning when it's uh, snow cover, it's almost impossible to catch these on some of the, the landscape. This actually was determined to be permanent. We called this a small permanent and uh, approached it appropriately for our, for our crossing type. And with Gordon's comments regarding First Nations with our First Nations consultations processes, demonstrating this level of rigor and commitment uh, makes that uh, understanding and, and acceptance come very well. So again, uh, part of the same project, uh, you can see three areas where water should flow and they were assessed and determined to be ephemeral. Uh, we still need to note and identify how we're uh, protecting those as best as possible for this linear type crossing for the vehicle and the uh, underground pipe in this situation. Uh, this particular corridor it has, uh, by the end of this winter, we'll have eight, eight or nine pipelines uh, buried in it uh, for, for different products for different diameters. Uh, 